بگم اشو قرآن حاوی هاون یانگ من چین دو وال سمحوی سیدی ما سی وقف نیی را دلیا را او بدل دنیا ده مرکا حسوا قرآن دو نق تاریق دی مسعب بن عمیر إن شاء الله ولا تفضل مسكور السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته you guys remember yesterday I don't take that it sounded like there was two people returned my salams we know one of the rights of a Muslim is that when they give you salam you return the salam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته because if you don't return my salams I know you're not listening to anything I have to say so I gotta hear everybody بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. إن شاء الله I'm going to tell you a story today. No more lecturing. إن شاء الله just a story. But this story is one of my favorite stories of the companions of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. And how many of you in here think you're a young person? How many of you in here are youth? Almost everybody in here is a youth. We know that youth in Islam, if you want to be technical, is into the age of 40. You're not mature until you reach 40. But the Prophet wasallam, when he was in his 50s, they were still calling him a young man. So we're all, most of us in here are still young. And you know, young people in, a, in, in, in our ummah, they seem to have this idea, because I travel around the world a lot and speak to a lot of the youth. The young people seem to have this idea that they can't do much. There's not much I can do, I'm too young. Or your parents will tell you, you're too young, don't worry about all of that uh, uh, getting involved in, in the masjid and da'wah. You're too young, go to school, get your degree, get you a nice job and a home and a car and a wife and some kids and then we'll worry about all of that. Or you're told at the masjid, you're too young to be involved in all of this, you know, let us, let us elders worry about this, and then inshallah, when you get older, you can worry about it. When we look at the seerah of the Prophet wasallam, the youth play a major role in the seerah. The young men and the young women around the Prophet wasallam. But there is one young man who I think stands out out of almost all of them. And his name is Mus'ab ibn Umair radi Allahu an. How many of you have ever heard of Mus'ab ibn Umair? Put your hands up. Okay, then that's why I need to do this. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was preaching in Mecca and he was still practicing Islam in secret, there was a young boy who was barely a teenager, maybe 12, 13 years old, if that, maybe 11, 10, depending on the, the ulama, you know, they have some different opinion about his age. Very young boy. Musab ibn Umair was one of the most handsome men of Quraysh. He was one of the most handsome boys of Mecca. Beautiful young man. And his mother was a woman who was not only wealthy, but she was influential. And in Meccan society, women were not treated very well. Mostly they were treated as property. But Mus'ab's mother was someone who was wealthy and influential. But she also hated the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. She hated him. But Mus'ab ibn Umair was gifted with hikmah, with wisdom. And it was known about Mus'ab that he grew up in luxury. His, his mother spoiled him like no child had been spoiled. He got whatever he wanted. And also he was so handsome that they say when he used to walk the streets in Mecca, women would line up in the streets to see him. And so that he could see them. And if anyone had a party, they would say you have to invite Mus'ab. In our days, you would say that he was a celebrity. He was a baller. Realistically. But he started to hear stories 
about a man named Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam that Muhammad was preaching a crazy religion. He was a magician, he was a sorcerer, he was a liar, he was all kinds of crazy things. But this same man a couple of years ago was called Al-Amin, the truthful, the honest one, the upright one. Everyone knew that he was a good person. Now he's a crazy, he's a madman, he's a magician, he's a sorcerer. So when Musab ibn Umayr heard about this, he said to himself, I have to listen to the man first. I want to hear from this man myself before I make a decision about him. So he found out that the Prophet ﷺ was preaching in secret at a house. Do any of you know the name of the man who was letting the Prophet ﷺ preach in his house? His name was Arqam. A man named Arqam was allowing the Prophet to preach in his house at night in secret. And Mus'ab found out about it and he went to sit with the Rasul ﷺ one night. And he asked the Messenger of Allah, tell me about Islam. And so the Prophet ﷺ told him about Islam in the most beautiful manner, with the most beautiful speech. And by the time the Prophet ﷺ had finished, Mus'ab ibn Umair replied to him by saying, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu annaka rasulullah. I bear witness that nothing has the right to be worshipped but Allah. And I bear witness that you are indeed the messenger of Allah. But the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, he knew who Mus'ab was, he knew who his mother was. So he told him, don't tell anyone about what you have just done. And definitely don't tell your mother. He told him to keep it a secret. So Mus'ab kept it a secret, but he kept going every night to visit the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And finally someone saw him going to visit the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam over and over again. And then they saw him praying one time. So they told his mother, do you know that your own son has become a Muslim? And his mother confronted him about it. And he did not lie to her. He told her, yes, I have accepted the religion of Islam. And I believe in Allah and his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. His mother became so infuriated that she decided to chain him to the wall in her house so that he could not go visit the Prophet sallallahu anymore. This young boy who was once a, a, a celebrity, a baller, having everything that anyone could want, now he is chained to the wall in his house. But his mother did not know is that she could chain him to the wall in her house, but she could not break the chain that tied his heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That was a chain that couldn't be broken. So, eventually, it became so hard in Mecca that the Prophet told the Muslims to, ab uh, to immigrate to Abyssinia, to Habasha, to Ethiopia. So, there was a group of Muslims who immigrated to Ethiopia, to Abyssinia. And Mus'ab realized when he heard that there were Muslims who migrated to Abyssinia to be able to practice their deen, he told his mother, look, I have given up this whole Islam thing. This Muhammad thing, I, you know, I, I, I let it go. And so she let him go. She freed him from the chains. And what did he do? He ran to Abyssinia. He left everything. He left that luxurious lifestyle. He left that life of fame and fortune and migrated with nothing to Abyssinia for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he stayed there for a while until he heard that things had become better in Mecca. You know that there was a rumor that went around that came to Abyssinia that all of Mecca has accepted Islam. So there were some people who went back and Mus'ab went back. But when they made it back to Mecca, they realized that the situation had not become better, it was actually worse. And when Mus'ab's mother saw him, she tried to catch him again. And Mus'ab ibn Umayr told his mother, By Allah, if you try to stop me this time, I will kill anyone who you put in front of me. He had become so dedicated to Allah and His Messenger, he said, if you try to stop me again, I'll kill whoever tries to stop me. So his mother let him go. At this time, 
there was something happening a few hundred miles away in a city known as Yathrib where there were two tribes known as the Aws wa Khazraj who were fighting with each other, killing each other, bloody wars going on for generation after generation. And there were some people heard about the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. So six of them went to Mecca to meet the Prophet wasallam at a place known as Aqaba, in, right outside of Mecca. And all six of them took their shahada and they told the Messenger of Allah wasallam that they wanted him to come to them. But it was not time yet. So the Prophet ﷺ said, No, I can't come, but I will send someone with you to teach you the deen of Allah. Azwajal. Now, who did the Prophet pick to sin with these people? To Yathrib. His first da'i ever. Who did he sin? Let's see. He had Abu Bakr was a Muslim at that time. Abdurrahman ibn Auf was a Muslim at that time. Ali was a Muslim at that time. Zayd ibn Thabit was a Muslim at that time. Zayd ibn Harith was a Muslim at that time. Some of the greatest companions were Muslim at that time. Who did he choose? He chose a teenage boy named Musad ibn Umair, a teenager, and sent him with them to, to Yathrib to teach them the deen of Allah. What happened in Yathrib when Musaib ibn Umair arrived? He started to teach the deen of Allah to people. And there were two tribes as I told you, Auz wa Khazraj, they were fighting amongst each other. When one of the leaders of the two tribes of the Aus, when he heard his name was Saad ibn Mu'ad, when Saad ibn Mu'ad heard there was a teenage boy spreading mischief and preaching a new religion in Yathrib, he said, oh no, 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 no. No, it's not gonna go down like that. We're not gonna have some foreigner come to our town and make changes. So he went to meet Mus'ad, but he didn't go to talk to him. He took his spear in his hand to kill Mus'ad. And when Mus'ad saw him, Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad told him, by Allah, I will kill you if you don't stop what you're doing. Look at the wisdom of this teenage boy named Mus'ad. He told him, Ya Sa'ad, are you not the leader of a large tribe? Are you not an educated man? Don't you have intellect? Don't you have good sense? Of course now, his, his kibr is at play, his arrogance, his, his nafs is, is now challenged. He said, yes, I'm intelligent. Of course I'm intelligent. He said, then why don't you sit down and listen to me? If you like what I have to say, then you can accept it. If you don't like what I have to say, then can't you just walk away? So he sat down and listened. After a few moments, Saad ibn Mu'ad, he said to Mus'ab ibn Umair, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad rasulullah He said, I bear witness nothing has the right to be worshipped but Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is indeed the messenger of Allah. This is one of the great leaders of the tribes accepting the da'wah of a teenager of a boy. And now when Saad went back to his tribe, he started to give them da'wah until almost all of the tribe of Aus started coming to Islam. And then the other tribe, Khazraj, who always competed with Aus, their leader was a man named Saad ibn Ubada. Saad ibn Ubada said, if Saad ibn Mu'ad is good enough to be a Muslim, why am I not good enough to be a Muslim? So he went to Musa'ib ibn Umair and he took his shahada too. And he said, I'm going to do better than Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad. I'm going to go convert all of my tribe to Islam. And he went and started converting the entire tribe of Khazraj to Islam. And now all of Medina, all of Yathrib is starting to enter into Islam because of a teenage boy, because of a little boy. The same teenagers that we tell them, oh, you're not big enough, you're not old enough to do da'wah yet. You're not old enough to be involved in the masjid yet. You're not old enough to learn the deen yet. Just, just enjoy your life. Saad ibn Mu'ad is bringing all of Yathrib to Islam. The next year, 70, about 70 people came from Yathrib back to Mecca, back to Aqaba. 
to meet the Prophet wasallam. And they not only took the shahada in front of our Rasul, they told him, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu an Muhammad Rasulullah. They also pledged bay'ah to our Rasul to protect him and defend him. Even if it cost them their own lives. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, come to us, you have a city now. We give you our city. It is now your city. And they said, we, and they changed the name of the city to Madinatun Nabi, to the city of the Prophet ﷺ, which it is known to this very day. And then after the Prophet ﷺ made istikhara, he asked Allah Azza wa what he should do. And Allah informed him that you should make hijrah to this place. He made his hijrah to Medina. And he established not only an ummah, but he established a society that would be the most perfect society that ever existed on the face of the globe. All because a young boy named Musab ibn Umair went to those people and did the job of da'wah and laid that foundation. So this young boy Musab ibn Umair, he changed the world. He changed the whole world. One young boy changed the world. Remember this same Musab ibn Umair used to be the most wealthy person. One of the most rich boys in Mecca. He gave up everything for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. There was a time in Medina when the companions were sitting around in a circle and Musab ibn Umair came and sat down next to them. And all of the companions from Mecca, the Muhajirin, they started to cry. Why did they cry? Because they know Musab ibn Umair, what he used to be. They know the luxury that he came from. They know the beauty that he had. And now they are looking at him, and he is the poorest from them. He is the poorest one of them. He is the weakest one of them. He wore the worst clothes, so harsh that they cut into his neck. His body had sores because of the, the, the way he used to sleep on the bare ground. So they began to cry because they said, look what Musa'ib ibn Umair has done to himself. But they didn't know that Musa'ib ibn Umair was after something else. He wasn't chasing dunya anymore. There came a time during the battle of Badr. How many of you know the battle of Badr that took place? Musa'ib ibn Umair was at the battle of Badr when the Muslims won their victory. The next battle, what, what was the name of the next battle? Uhud, Uhud. And I told this story, the same story I'm telling you now. Alhamdulillah, I had the opportunity to tell this story on Mount Uhud about six months ago. And it started raining in Medina. MashaAllah. During the battle of Uhud, you all know the story of Uhud, right? The fitna that took place. On the day of Uhud, the Prophet ﷺ, during every battle, he would give someone the flag to hold the flag. And that was the most honored person on that day, was the person who got to hold the flag. Because this flag represents La ilaha illallah to the world. And the person who holds the flag, their only job was, don't drop the flag. That's it, just don't drop it. On the day of Uhud, the Prophet ﷺ gave that flag to Musa ibn Umair. And Musab ibn Umair is still a teenager. He hasn't even barely reached 20 yet. He gave him the flag on the day of Uhud. And his job was do not drop this flag no matter what. And we all know the fitna that took place. The archers, they left their post. And Khalid ibn Walid radi Allahu an, he came from behind and caught the Muslims from surprise and caused the Muslims to, to have a loss. And during this fitna that took place, Someone came and got close to our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam and they smashed his face. Cut a gash in his face so big that you could see his teeth through it. And he hit the ground. Our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam hit the ground on the day of Uhud. And then someone said, we have killed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And everybody started to run because everybody's saying Muhammad is dead. So everybody's going crazy. Even some of the great companions, they sat down, they didn't know what to do next. How can this be possible? When someone, and then, when someone came to Mus'ab ibn Umair, 
they told him he's still holding the flag. They said, Ya Mus'ab, don't you know that someone has killed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Muhammad is dead. What are you doing? You know what he said? And this is before the verse was revealed. He said, Muhammad is nothing but a messenger. And the messengers have died before him. And he kept fighting. Saying to himself, Muhammad is nothing but a messenger and the messengers have passed away before him. And then someone else said, no, Muhammad is not dead. He is here fighting with us. So there was conflicting news. So when Mus'ab ibn Umayyah thought that the Prophet ﷺ could be alive, he decided to give his own life to protect the Prophet ﷺ. Truly, he loved the Prophet more than he loved his own soul. Because he started dragging everyone to, to him. He started to flamboyantly dance in front of everyone, fight with me, fight with me. So that everyone would come and try to attack him. And he fought with them until someone came and chopped off the arm that was holding the flag. They chopped off the hand that was holding the flag. And the flag hit the ground. Now, for most of us, that's enough. I lose my hand, I'm done. That's it, I'm out of here. I, I, gotta, I gotta go fix this. But Musab ibn Umair was someone who was truly dedicated to Allah Azza wa He was truly dedicated to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He reached down with the other hand and he picked up the flag and he started to attract attention to himself again. Saying to himself, Muhammad is nothing but a messenger. The messengers have passed away before him. And then someone came and cut off the other hand that was holding the flag. Now, even for the best of us, if your job is to hold the flag and you lost both of your hands, I think it would be okay for you to go sit out. I think it's okay for you to go sit this one out. You're told to hold the flag, you don't have hands. Khalas, you're done, go. You know, free with your life. Seriously, you're done. But Mus'ab ibn Umair, he wasn't done. Because he hadn't given everything he could give yet. So he reached down with the two stumps that were left. He scooped the flag up, pressed it to his chest, and continued to fight with them and attract attention to himself. Until they came and stabbed him and struck him. Until he hit the ground dead. And they said he had over 70 stab and cut wounds on him. And then, as we know, after the battle, the Meccans mutilated the dead bodies of the Muslims. They mutilated them. They cut off their eyes, they cut off their noses and made necklaces. They stomped on them with their horses. They just mutilated all of the, the, the shuhada. After the Prophet ﷺ and the companions came down from the mountain, after the Meccans had left, they were looking for the shuhada. But there was a couple of people the Prophet ﷺ was looking for. He was looking for his uncle Hamza. He was looking for Ja'far. And he was looking for Mus'ab ibn Umair. He was asking them, have you seen Hamza? Have you seen Ja'far? Have you seen Mus'ab? And when they found Mus'ab ibn Umair, they all, everyone just couldn't believe it. Because he was almost unrecognizable. They had stomped on him and cut him and he lost both arms. But when they found him, do you know where they found the flag that he was supposed to hold? They found it between his teeth. He never dropped it. Not even in death. They found the flag still between his teeth. And when the Prophet ﷺ found Mus'ab ibn Umair, he began to cry. Because he's looking at the same boy that he knew as a little boy that was rich and wealthy and, 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 and popular and beautiful. Now he is laying on the ground in the dust, having given everything for Allah Azza wa even so much that they could barely recognize him. And he told the companions, go and get all of the property of the shuhada, because they give the inheritance right away. And also he said, go get his kafan, because every sahaba, all of the sahabi, they believed that death was haq. They believed that death was reality. So they kept their own shroud at all times to prepare them for the next life. Because that's how much they believed in it. So when they went to Mus'ab ibn Umair's house, they came back with two things. Three things actually. They came back with a pitcher to pour water. They came back with a bowl to make wudu. And they came back with half of a kafan. And they said, that's all he has. 
This is all he has. He didn't own anything in this life. And the coffin was not even enough to cover him. When they would cover his head, his feet would stick out. When they would cover his feet, his head would stick out. So the Prophet ﷺ said, cover his head and then cover his feet with lemongrass. And they buried him right there at Uhud. And he is still, his grave, along with all of the other shuhada of Uhud, are still right there today. You can go visit them. You can't go to the graves anymore because they blocked it off because you have the Rafida and others that do crazy things at the graves. But you can go stand on Uhud and see those graves. The reason I tell you this story is that if any one of you think that just because you're young, brothers or sisters, just because you're young, you can't do something great for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can't do something great for the deen. You can't do something great for this ummah. There is a young man who is buried at Uhud that would, he would disagree with what you think. There is a young man named Mus'ab ibn Umair who is buried at Uhud that would disagree with you. And for those of you who think that youth is a weakness, not only is there a young man named Mus'ab ibn Umair who disagree with you, but there are tens and hundreds of Sahabi who were youth, who changed the whole world as we know it, who would disagree with you. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would disagree with you. Because he always looked at youth and saw them as people who can do great things for Allah. When we look at some of the greatest of the Sahaba, some of the greatest of the Sahaba that did the greatest things for Islam were young men and women. When we look at people like Aisha radiallahu anha, they try to accuse her and accuse the Prophet ﷺ of evil because of her young age. But wallahi, it was because of her youth that she did so many great things for this deen. When we look at people like Umar ibn al-Khattab, the great Umar, who when he accepted Islam, the Prophet had the, the Izza to go preach Islam. When Umar accepted Islam, he was barely 20 years old. In his early 20s. And all of the companions were being tortured. But when he's accepted Islam, he told the Prophet ﷺ, What are you doing hiding in this house? Are we not upon haqq? And are they not upon batil? The Prophet said, yes. He said, then I will not worship Allah in secret. And he went to the Qaaba and told all of the Quraysh, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And they fought him from day until night. And he never gave up. This is the same Umar, when he was still a young man, in his early 30s, when all of the Muslims made hijrah, they made hijrah in secret, right? Did not all of the muhajireen make hijrah in secret? Not all of them. Not all of them. Umar waited for everyone to leave. Umar waited for everyone to leave. And then he waited until Dhuhr. Dhuhr was when all of the Quraysh would sit next to the shade of the Kaaba. He waited till Dhuhr and went to the Kaaba. And he stood in front of all the Quraysh and said, Ya Quraysh, Ana Umar ibn al-Khattab. I am Umar the son of Khattab. And I am making hijrah to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam in Medina. If any of you want to make your mothers cry, if any of you want to make your wives widows, and you want to make your children orphans, then I dare you to stop me. I dare you to stop me. And he left. You know how many people followed him? Only a couple. And he beat him up. When we look at the... And I'm, this is my last one. There are too many. If I wanted to give you stories about the, the, the youth around the Prophet, we would be here for hours. Last one. When the Prophet ﷺ was in his last sickness, he appointed an army to go check the Persian and Romans because they were acting kind of crazy. He gathered an army to go check them. 
Do any of you know the person whom he put in charge of that army? Usama bin Zayd. How old was Usama bin Zayd? 17, 18 years old. A teenager. Who was Muslim at that time? All of the Sahabi were Muslim. Even the great Sayfullah Khadr ibn Walid was put under Usama bin Zayd to obey him. Abu Bakr was told obey him. Umar was told obey him. Ali was told obey him. And some people started to complain. We like to complain. That Osama bin Zaid is a boy, he's a kid. What, the, what, what are you doing? And when the Prophet heard about this, what did he do? He went on his member and he said, Wallahi, there is no one on this earth that is better and more dearer to Allah. There is no one that is more dearer to Allah other than Osama, except for his father. Who is his father? Zayd ibn, Zayd ibn Harith. He said, there's no one better than Osama than his father. And when that army went out, it came back with success. And it went out after the death of the Prophet ﷺ. And Abu Bakr did not change Osama. So we have to understand, dear brothers and sisters, the power of youth. The Prophet said, take advantage of five things before five other things. And one of them he said, Shababaka qabla hamramik. Shababaka qabla haramik. Take advantage of your youth before you get old. We have to let these youth do something. We have to train these youth to love Allah and His Messenger, to follow the deen of Allah Azza wa And we need to put them in positions in our communities. Everyone keeps asking me, how do we get the youth involved in the masjid? You get them involved. You don't have some basketball tournament that's going to bring all of the youth and mashallah, they're all going to become salih. It's not going to happen like that. You make them involved in the masjid. It is a shame that we have second generation Muslims, third generation Muslims coming up in America. And only 1%, around 1% of our Imams were born and raised in America. That is a shame. Wallahi, that's a shame. If we don't start training our children to take our places and become our leaders in the next life, I mean the next generation, then we are not learning from Allah and His Messenger. Because the sunnah of Allah Azza was that He always sent messengers and raise them up from amongst themselves. When Allah refers to messengers in the Quran, He says, and we sent to them their brother Harun, we sent to them their brother Musa, we sent to them to their brother Shu'aib. And when Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he made dua for Mecca, what was his dua? Ya Allah, raise up amongst them a messenger that will warn them and guide them. So if we are not training our children to take places of leaderships in our masajid, then we are training our children to fail. Wallahi, the most successful communities that I found in America, some of the most successful communities I found in America, you know who their imams are? Their imams are people who were born and raised right here in the United States of America. Maybe they went overseas and learned the deen of Allah from the ulama, yes. But they came back and took positions of leadership. And those communities are some of the most successful, some of those most vibrant, some of the most beautiful communities in America. Wallahi. Because those imams understand the Muslims, they understand the non-Muslims, they understand the culture, they understand the language, they understand the problems. And they know the deen of Allah Azza wa so they can connect the two together. We need to learn from this example, please, dear brothers and sisters. If you see one of these youth that, 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 that look like they want to have a sincere love for Allah and His Messenger, they want to learn the deen, pull them to the side and train them. Don't discourage them. Do not discourage them. Train them. Because wallahi, if we learn anything from the story of Musab ibn Umair, it's that one person who loves Allah Azza wa and His Messenger, no matter how young they may be, they can change the entire world as we know it. And I think that in our ummah, we have a couple of Musab ibn Umayr's running around. They just don't know it yet. If it can only take one, I think if we can find maybe four or five, then we can change the whole world again.
ان شاء الله تعالى جزاك الله خيرا اقول لك هذا هذا واستغفر ولكم فاستغفره انه الغفور الرحيم any of you that uh, didn't get the dvds yesterday come right outside the tables outside with all the dvds you know those dvds go to support the many projects of da'wah that i have running currently which the budget for all of the da'wah projects that i am currently doing is over a million dollars a year and that takes a lot of work to be able to cover and if anyone has any questions for me i'll be at the table or if anyone wants to get in touch with me i'm not very hard to get in touch with you can find me on my website yushaevans.com you can find me on facebook yushaevans you, and if you want to find me on Facebook, find me quickly because I'm going towards the 5,000 friend limit again. I already went over it once and started a new one and I'm back there again. Uh, or you can find me on Twitter, all of those places. I'm very easy to get a hold of inshallah and I do to re- try to respond to everyone. So if you have a need to get in touch with me, you can get in touch with me there. And finally, all success comes from Allah. Anything that was good, know that good is from Allah Azza wa and He is the only one that deserves praise for that. And all evil came from my own self and my lack of knowledge. Jazakur khairan wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.